Hi, everybody, and welcome to Worship Today. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Chris. I'm the pastor here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Loveland, Colorado. This is my son, Brennan, my wife, Rachel, my daughter, Celia, our dogs, uh, Riley and Apollo. And uh, we're glad you're here with us today. We hope you're having a, a great day. Um, here at Trinity, in this time of year, it's uh, stewardship season, a time when we talk about um, giving, how we give to the church, also how we serve at the church, uh, and the ways that those things help make our ministry happen. And today we've got a, a great stewardship talk from Craig Schilling. Uh, so Craig, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Craig Schilling, and I've been a member of Trinity Lutheran Church for the past 33 years. And for the past 20 years, I've been really involved in taking care of the grounds outside of church. Now, mind you, I don't do it all myself. I said, I've got a great helper and my wife, Mary Jane, and my brother and sister-in-law, Peg, and Tim and Peggy McGlynn help as well when they're, when they're around town to, to lend a hand. But I've been asked recently, why do I do the churchyard? And um, it's really quite simple for me. I said, number one, I enjoy being outside. I, I love the great outdoors and um, number two I truly enjoy doing yard work but I think the biggest reason I do what I do is I think it it says a lot about our church not for just our members but for people that drive by our church or the neighbors that live around the church that the yard looks not so much just the yard but our property looks nice we, we trim trees around the yard I am constantly working on the sprinkler system and um, so that's why I do what I do around the churchyard. Uh, I, I know for some of you, you might think, you know, the grounds look pretty dry and the yard sometimes doesn't look so great. And, and the last two summers have been extremely hot and it's been hard to keep that yard, you know, where it needs to be. But I, when, when I mow the yard at church, I do the same things on the churchyard that I do at my home. And uh, again, I th the reason I do it is just, I think it needs to be aesthetically pleasing for people that drive by or pull up to our church because I think it says a lot about what goes on inside as to what it looks like on the outside. So there you have why I do what I do at the churchyard. So um, hope this all finds you safe and healthy and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. you. Let us pray. Beloved God, all, all things, things that, that are good come from, from you. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now we go to some special music this week from our chancel choir. Thank you so much, choir.
Thank you so much, choir. And now we go to Jean for our reading today. Thanks, Jean. Today's reading comes from the book of Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you, what, what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for today comes from Psalm 80. We'll chant this responsively by verse. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. And our gospel reading for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. This is Jesus talking here, and he says, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased its two tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Not very nice, right? Goodness. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. And so they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, 
what will he do to those tenants? What do you think? Is the owner of the vineyard going to be very happy? Mm-mm. Not so much, right? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. Well, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. Celia and Brennan, do you remember the first time I showed you guys this guitar? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah? What do you remember about it the first time you saw it? It looked a bit beat up. (laughs) (laughs) It looked a little beat up, right? Right. What do you remember about it? Pretty much the same. Pretty much the same thing? Well, this is a guitar. Uh, If you're a a regular worshiper worshiper at Trinity, you might recognize this guitar. Uh, Jeff and Carol donated this guitar. This was Carol's father's guitar. And uh, it's a really cool old guitar that they donated to Trinity. But the challenge was it had sat around for a while, right? Now, was it an awesome guitar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is an awesome guitar, right? But it had kind of sat in a closet for a little while and it needed a little help, right? Right. The neck was kind of broken in here and some of the dials were kind of corroded and it just needed to be kind of cleaned up and put back together, right? Right. Well, that's a lot of the work that Jesus is doing in the vineyard. Jesus is saying, you know what? The people of Israel, this beautiful vineyard that I planted, it needs to be restored. It's awesome. It was created to be awesome. I created these people to be awesome, just like this guitar was created to be awesome. But it needed a little work, right? It needed a little help. And so just like this guitar where we did a little work on it, we took it to some folks who knew what they were doing and they fixed it up and it's an amazingly cool guitar now, right? Right. But that's the work that Jesus is doing on us. Right? Sometimes we're a bit of a mess. Sometimes things have um, kind of been left and let go for a little while. Sometimes we need a little work done on us. And that's what Jesus is always doing. Jesus is doing that work of restoring what was awesome and making sure that uh, we know that we are loved and created to be amazing and that Jesus is always working on us and restoring us. Isn't that kind of awesome? Oh, yeah. I think oh, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much for the ways that you come to us when we are broken and worn out. And we thank you for the ways that you restore us and bring us to new life. Help us remember that when we are feeling broken down and worn out, uh, that you will always be there, that you never run away from us, but that you choose to join us in the midst of those challenges uh, so that we might have new life in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Gracious Lord, we know that we cannot do justice to your word. And so we pray today that your word would come and bring justice to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are a couple of adages about preaching that I think most preachers, particularly Lutherans, have picked up along the way. One of them is that preaching should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. This week, Jesus is afflicting the comfortable. 
In fact, we're in a stretch of readings in worship right now where Jesus will, will spend the next few weeks afflicting the comfortable. Doesn't that just make you want to come back to worship every week? Last week, Jesus was calling out the chief priests and the elders for putting on the appearance of doing the Father's will, while also completely ignoring God's justice, the justice that Jesus and his cousin John had been proclaiming. And it forced us to ask the question of whether we are interested in the perception of being a Christian or if we're actually interested in the very real challenge of following Jesus. Today's parable is just a continuation of that conversation from last week that Jesus was having with the chief priests and the elders. And Jesus is not letting up. In today's episode of Uncomfortable Stories with Jesus, he tells a story about a landowner who builds a beautiful, a beautiful vineyard and leaves it with tenants. It was a pretty familiar arrangement in Jesus' day. When the harvest came, the landowner sent servants to collect his portion of the harvest. The tenants decided they wanted it all for themselves. And so they beat up some of the servants and killed others. The landowner sent even more servants another time, and the same happened to them, and so the landowner sent his son. And the tenants thought, now is our chance. Let's kill the son so we can get his inheritance. Now let me ask you, does that sound reasonable to you? I want you to to think this one through for just a minute. Does it make sense for these tenants to think that if they kill the landowner's son, they would have the landowner's inheritance for their own? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? I mean, what would make somebody think that they could just take the inheritance of the kingdom of God all for their own, on their own terms? Well, believe it or not, this has been a theme for us since pretty much the very beginning. If you go back to the Tower of Babel story back in Genesis 11, that's exactly what they were trying to do. They were just trying to build a tower tall enough so that they could reach heaven and invade it for their own and take it over for themselves. And while the poetry of our reading from Isaiah today isn't quite so violent, it's still an oracle about the people producing what they wanted instead of what God wanted. Now let's get back to our chief priests and our Pharisees. How are they trying to take the inheritance for their own without following the Father's will? Well, let's talk about what these leaders were known for. To be fair, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the elders were actually pretty zealous about keeping God's law. They were remarkably well-versed in the Torah, and they made sure that they and everyone around them observed everything to the absolute tiniest details. They were actually kind of the good guys. But here was the problem. With their absolute laser focus on keeping the law in all of its details, they often missed the point of the law entirely. The law existed and still exists today for the sake of loving God and for the sake of loving God our neighbors. It's what we call righteousness, living in right relationship with each other. The law ultimately exists for justice. And in the process of so meticulously following every detail of the law, they completely missed out on the righteousness and justice that the law was meant to bring about. And people suffered 
because of it. This was not just a first century issue. This has been our way of trying to take the kingdom of God on our own terms for centuries. We often think that if we just follow the right rules, and if we can just get everyone else to follow those same rules, we can be righteous on our own, apart from Christ. But sometimes we can get so focused on the rules that we forget about people. We do it with health care, we do it with guns, we do it with abortion and immigration, we do it with gay people, we do it with masks. We get so focused on the rule, thinking that we can be righteous on our own without Christ, that we completely forget about justice. We completely forget about what it actually means to live in a right relationship with God and in a right relationship with our neighbors. And people suffer because of that. This is a critical time to be thinking about these things. And as followers of Jesus who are called to be more interested in discipleship than in appearances, this right now is our opportunity to rise above the polarized nonsense. In a world of pandemics and Supreme Court picks and presidential elections and all of the issues that we have, we have a calling to step outside of that overwhelming current and to proclaim that there is a love and there is a justice that is far, far more powerful than the divisions that we have come to know so well in this world. That love, by the way, is the most remarkable part of this story. The landowner didn't send in soldiers. The landowner didn't send in swordsmen to clear out the wicked tenants, which frankly would have made perfect sense if you listened to the story. Instead, the landowner sent his son knowing full well the risk, knowing it would possibly mean his life. It's a pattern that we've repeated throughout human history. We'll always try to claim the kingdom of God on our own terms, apart from Christ, in ways that will harm the people around us. Sometimes we'll even claim that we are doing those things on God's behalf. But still, even in spite of all of that, God is still sending God's Son. God knows we are broken. God knows we are inclined to focus more on the rules than we are on our relationships. God knows we want the kingdom on our terms. And when we do, in spite of ourselves, God is still sending Christ. That truly is the cornerstone of our faith. In spite of our rejection of God's love, in spite of our rejection of God's justice, in spite of us thinking we can do it all on our own, in spite of Christ, God still comes to us in bread and and in wine. Christ still comes to us through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the faces of our neighbors around us, inviting us to come, to lean into justice, and to live into the love that Christ is willing to die for. And I say thanks be to God for that. Amen. We sing our hymn of the day, How Firm a Foundation. Let's sing.
we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we give thanks for the offerings that we have received. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all of those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life, that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who cared deeply for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering. Equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, or soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today. Anne, Sue, Jen. Deanne, Ruthie, Joan, Amy, and those that we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Listen as we call to you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Siblings in Christ. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. And again, after supper, our Lord took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup 
is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and make us bold to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ today, uh, we invite you to uh, proclaim those words to whoever is close by to you. We remember that it isn't simply uh, bread or wine or grape juice that we share, but it is truly the promises that come along, that we are children of God, that our sins are forgiven. And so not only do we share the meal, uh, but we also proclaim that promise to one another, that Christ is present with us. Uh, So I invite you to turn to your neighbors, whoever is close to you, uh, share this meal with them with the words, the body of Christ is broken for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. And if you are alone today, let me speak those words of promise to you now. The body of Christ is broken for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. Let's share together. to share over there, and Brennan and I can share here. Say the body of Christ is broken for you. Brennan, the body of Christ is broken for you. Brennan, the body of Christ is broken for you. Amen. The body of Christ is broken for you. Say the blood of Christ is shed for you. Thank you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen. Bread in the blood of Christ is shed for you. And may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace and in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ, and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's go in peace and remember the poor. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Did you hear that? Did you hear it? It was like a pterodactyl. It was.